Two years ago, by a series of strange coincidences, I found myself attending a garden party at Westminster Abbey. I was a bit uncomfortable. It's not that the other guests weren't pleasant and amicable, and Father Graham, who had organized the party, was nothing if not a gracious and charming host. But I felt more than a little out of place. At one point, Father Graham intervened, saying that there was someone by a nearby fountain whom I would certainly want to meet. She turned out to be a trim, well-appointed young woman who, he explained, was an attorney. But more of the activist kind. She works for a foundation that provides legal support for anti-poverty groups in London. You'll probably have a lot to talk about. We chatted. She told me about her job. I told her I had been involved for many years with the global justice movement. Anti-globalization movement. As it was usually called in the media. She was curious. She'd of course read a lot about Seattle, Genoa, the tear gas, and street battles, but... Well, had we really accomplished anything by all of that? Actually, I said, I think it's kind of amazing how much we did manage to accomplish in those first couple of years. For example? Well, for example, we managed to almost completely destroy the IMF. As it happened, she didn't actually know what the IMF was, so I offered that the International Monetary Fund basically acted as the world's debt enforcers. You might say the high finance equivalent of the guys who come and break your legs. I launched into historical background explaining how, during the 70s oil crisis, OPEC countries ended up pouring so much of their newfound riches into Western banks that the banks couldn't figure out where to invest the money. How Citibank and Chase therefore began sending agents around the world trying to convince third world dictators and politicians to take out loans. At the time, this was called go-go banking. And if you look at the assets and the liabilities of the banking system, you find enormous credits made to structures that are not necessarily creditworthy, structures called Nigeria or Mexico or Brazil or Argentina, in amounts that total all over the world now a trillion dollars for the world's banking system. And I'm worried because of the things that Mr. Rowatton pointed out, the huge amounts of assets in foreign countries. I'm also worried because the banking system has undergone such a dramatic change that in many ways it was not prepared for. Bankers never used to have to be involved in this world of go-go banking, of taking higher risks, of moving their money in and out so quickly. How they started out at extremely low rates of interest that almost immediately skyrocketed to 20% or so due to tight U.S. money policies in the early 80s. How, during the 80s and 90s, this led to the Third World Debt Crisis. How the IMF then stepped in to insist that, in order to obtain refinancing, poor countries would be obliged to abandon price controls on basic foodstuffs or even policies of keeping strategic food reserves and abandon free healthcare and free education. How all of this led to the collapse of all the most basic supports for some of the poorest and most vulnerable people on earth. I spoke of poverty, of the looting of public resources, the collapse of societies, endemic violence, malnutrition, hopelessness, and broken lives. But what was your position? The lawyer asked. About the IMF? We wanted to abolish it. No, I mean about the third world debt. Oh, we wanted to abolish that too. The immediate demand was to stop the IMF from imposing structural adjustment policies, which were doing all the direct damage. But we managed to accomplish that surprisingly quickly. The more long-term aim was debt amnesty, something along the lines of the biblical jubilee. As far as we were concerned, I told her, 30 years of money flowing from the poorest countries to the richest was quite enough. But, she objected, as if it were self-evident, they'd borrowed money. Surely one has to pay one's debts. It was at this point that I realized this was going to be a very different sort of conversation than the one I had originally anticipated. Where to start? I could have begun by explaining how these loans had originally been taken out by unelected dictators who placed most of it directly into their Swiss bank accounts, and ask her to contemplate the justice of insisting that the lenders be repaid, not by the dictator or even by his cronies, but by literally taking food from the mouths of hungry children. Or to think about how many of these poor countries had actually already paid back what they'd borrowed three or four times now, but that through the miracle of compound interest, it still hadn't made a significant dent on the principal. I could also observe that there was a difference between refinancing loans and demanding that in order to obtain refinancing, countries have to follow some orthodox free market economic policy designed in Washington or Zurich that their citizens had never agreed to and never would and that it all was a bit dishonest to insist that the countries adopt democratic constitutions and then also insist that, whoever gets elected, they have no control over their country's policies anyway. 
or that the economic policies imposed by the IMF didn't even work. But there was a more basic problem. The very assumption that debts have to be repaid. Actually, the remarkable thing about the statement, one has to pay one's debts, is that even according to standard economic theory, it isn't true. A lender is supposed to accept a certain degree of risk. If all loans, no matter how idiotic, were still retrievable, if there were no bankruptcy laws for instance, the results would be disastrous. What reason would lenders have not to make a stupid loan? Well, I know that sounds like common sense, but the funny thing is, economically, that's not how loans are actually supposed to work. Financial institutions are supposed to be ways of directing resources towards profitable investments. If a bank were guaranteed to get its money back, plus interest, no matter what it did, the whole system wouldn't work. Say, I were to walk into the nearest branch of the Royal Bank of Scotland and say, you know, I just got a really great tip on the horses. Think you could lend me a couple million quid? Obviously, they'd just laugh at me. But that's just because they know if my horse didn't come in, there'd be no way for them to get the money back. But imagine there was some law that said they were guaranteed to get their money back no matter what happens. Even if that meant, I don't know, selling my daughter into slavery or harvesting my organs or something. Well, in that case, why not? Why bother waiting for someone to walk in who has a viable plan to set up a laundromat or some such? Basically, that's the situation the IMF created on a global level. Which is how you could have all those banks willing to fork over billions of dollars to a bunch of obvious crooks in the first place. You know the drill, bitch. All your bitcoins on this flash drive for your debt. Oh, come on, dude. That's all my bitcoin for lunch, man. Please. Now, or I'll get my truck again. No, no, cost no. David Graeber was an anthropologist well-known on the political left for being able to succinctly retort against almost any capitalist talking point. Seriously, watch any interview or speech by him. He's great at it. You're right, Benny Boy. These big government anarchist nimrods have obviously never read the Bible or even a basic biology textbook, because otherwise they would know that the only two sexes are the one you wish you could have with AOC and the one you wish you could have with just her feet. I may not believe basic biology about evolution, which I know is the work of the devil, but that won't stop me from claiming there are only two genders. And aren't you Koch Brothers types in favor of pointless consumerism? If Hasbro and General Electric had been the ones to come out with all these new genders in the form of subscription services and overpriced gender insurance, I bet you and your followers would be all over it. The new thigh eye feature of the Femboy 2022 gender is proof of the innovative power of the free market. Anyway, I think you might have a point about they them pussy, because I got down and dirty with some septum pierced alternate milk drinking eyeshadowed fembies, and let me tell you, my rocket ships just ain't been right since. And the rocket ship and post! David Graeber became known outside the left because of a short article he wrote entitled On the Phenomenon of Bullshit Jobs, but that's a topic for another day. Today we'll be talking about what I consider to be his magnum opus, debt. The first 5,000 years. This video is going to be an adaptation of the first chapter, in hopes of spreading its knowledge and message to a wider audience, and in other hopes of getting more people other than the eternally online nerds and academics to read it. If you enjoy this video, or at least feel a strong emotion of, wow, so that's how the world really works, huh? Then I highly, highly encourage you to check out a copy from your local library. Or pirate it, I'm a socialist, not a cop. I've had the idea for this video for a while. Basically, every time I hear someone, usually someone who considers themselves to be center-left, like a liberal or a sock dem, talk about the International Monetary Fund, I want to pull my hair out. They talk about it in a vagueish, almost entirely positive light. And the feeling me and the rest of the left get hearing someone do this is what I imagine it's like being a virologist or genetic engineer and hearing someone talk about how we just don't know what's in these vaccines. Today, I am a mom of a child who had autism. You heard her say, had autism. Jenny says he's well now. She says he took probiotics, threw up, and pooped out a bunch of yeast, and now he's fine. We don't have the vibrational frequency to hold, host that virus. And I taught her that. So if you, if you don't have that vibra vib vibrational frequency right here, you're not going to get it. Yeah. But I am not alone in this feeling. The exigence to inform the layperson about just how awful an organization the IMF is was luckily also felt by a much more talented writer named David Graeber. And along with organizing direct action and major efforts to abolish the thing, 
wrote it all down better than I ever could hope to. Yeah, I'm pulling up the Femboy Hooters with the homies on our scooters. Saying that the IMF helps struggling countries finance improvements to their economies is the mainstream view of what the IMF does. But what I hope is now clear from the start of this video is that that is a load of nonsense. I mean, you're not supposed to, in a bourgeois environment, you're never allowed to say that somebody lied. Oh, they must have somehow convinced themselves they believed that, you know? The IMF is an evil organization. Let's be adults about this. People and organizations can be evil. I'm an atheist, and I think the people who run this thing are going to hell. If you ever heard the term neocolonialism, or heard someone talking about how the United States and Western Europe continue to colonize the world, despite most of the Americas in Africa having independent governments, but not always independent currencies, links in the doobly-doo, well, this is part of what they're talking about. Debt and the IMF are how the capitalist superpower of the world, the United States of America, does its colonialism and imperialism in the modern day. Well, at least part of it. It's not so much the direct killing and violence and territory grabbing of the days of old, though we do do that too, don't get me wrong, but it's more indirect violence, property relations, and social murder. And don't think former European colonies of black and brown people are the only places that suffer underneath the thumb of the IMF. In the late 80s and 90s, the world's second major superpower was largely, due to capitalist quote-unquote free market reforms, reduced to a minor bankrupt petrol state. I'm of course talking about the USSR. The collapse of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics was arguably the single biggest economic catastrophe in the 20th century. The industrial base of almost every constituent republic was obliterated due to the market reforms. GDP per capita was cut to a quarter of what it was before. Life expectancy plummeted. Privatization allowed the rise of oligarchs and gangs that Russia and a lot of Eastern Europe are known for today, and most former members still have not recovered economically. To make this a bit relevant to contemporary news, both Russia and Ukraine alike had their own sets of oligarchs and debt their people on the order of billions of dollars to the International Monetary Fund. To this day, where much of that money went is not known but it sure as hell wasn't spent on food subsidies, which were gutted during the breakup and price controls were lifted, causing massive inflation. Well, if you're a socialist, you know exactly where the money went. It went right into the bank accounts of billionaires and all their friendly cronies and crony friends. Ukraine was hit pretty hard. Its economy still hasn't recovered, and neither has even its food output. In 2013, Ukraine was already in massive debt to the IMF because it was trying to get the foreign currency it needed to rebuild its economy after it was destroyed by the advice of Western economists. Putin at this time was working very hard to stop Ukrainian exports and imports, imposing harsh sanctions, and basically trying to bleed Ukraine dry. It has been described by some as a guerrilla war carried out by the Russian state. During this time of need and intense suffering for the people of Ukraine, the IMF said that it would not extend another loan unless there was a 40% increase in natural gas bills for Ukrainians and large and core budget cuts from the state spending. Just to put things in context, in 2010 the IMF had already demanded and won a 50% increase in gas bills to Ukrainians. The European Union at the time also said that it would not be cooperating with Ukraine unless it accepted that deal from the IMF. The IMF had also previously denied $6 billion in funding over the Ukrainian government raising the minimum wage and increasing pensions. Oh, and to explain the gas bill thing, the Ukrainian government would buy gas and then sell it to Ukrainians at heavily subsidized prices. Raising gas bills was just a new tax that the IMF wanted Ukraine to raise to make sure that they could get paid back. Instead of having Ukraine tax billionaires or oligarch wealth or something, they decided, like they always do, to extract their blood money from people trying not to freeze to death. So when you see the managing director of the IMF saying that Ukraine, that is, one of the countries most heavily in debt to the IMF, which is currently fighting a war for its survival, whose industrial base is being bombed day after day after having been eviscerated in the 80s and 90s, and has been paying the IMF on the order of $100 million per year for the past 30 years, needs more financial support? You know that she's a cunt. She's going to hell. Now, don't think the US is alone in this financial imperialist scheme. Chinese imperialism is taking a very similar route as of late. Since they don't control the IMF, they have been issuing loans to many of the same countries and regions as the US and Europe through their Belt and Road Initiative. 
they offer to finance a port in some third world country, and then once that country starts missing loan payments, the port comes under the control of China for 99 years. What I hope has become clear is why so many leftists don't even want to debate the IMF, or even talk about how neocolonialism happens through the world of finance and international lending and Wall Street. It's so hard to focus your thoughts when your emotions are racing around in your head like a swarm of bees. Bits of thought and emotion, connections to dozens of other topics. You either put out an out-of-context mess or a pure emotional rant. I mean, it's hard not to sound like a crazy person who's blaming the Rothschilds when you talk about how Wall Street is directly taking money from poor, starving African children. When someone does get a coherent argument out about third world international debt or the International Monetary Fund, they are often misunderstood. There's a lot of background knowledge needed to fully understand the IMF and to kind of be in the right mind state or mentally primed to fully digest an article about it. Take this recent article from the Jacobin. Well, actually four articles. All of them say that one of the best helpings that can actually happen to Ukraine right now is to cancel their foreign debt. Who do they owe this debt to? The IMF. Or similar organizations such as the World Bank or Europe's own version of the IMF, the EIB. A reminder that Ukraine, though it does owe a lot of money to the IMF itself, also owes a lot of money to other institutions. David Graeber talked about how the IMF acted as the world's debt enforcers. I've been focusing on just the numbers directly to the IMF because those are the easiest to find. But Ukraine owes about $125 billion in total most of it to private investment groups. Tons of countries have been offering loans to Ukraine with, again, requirements for structural readjustment. There are, right now, in the United States, private investment companies, either whose entire profits or a very substantial portion of their profits, come from them stealing wealth from indebted countries worldwide and their poorest citizens. It's not just the unfair trade deals between primary producers and secondary producers, between raw material producing countries and later stage industrial production countries. It's also just the fact that due to property relations enforced by the United States government, a bunch of the wealthiest people on the face of the earth who have no accountability to anyone are guaranteed legally a set amount of money from the world's poorest citizens. And the only time that any one of the major news broadcasters or publishers in the United States will ever talk about this is when they and their friends have decided that all of these citizens are being too slow to pay their benefactors. Leftist political streamer Vosh, or Voosh if you're Canadian, fell victim to this ignorance, as many of us do, and laughed at the Jacobin and the authors of these articles. Nothing against Voosh, by the way. The US, after all, is mostly in debt to itself, so when you talk about other countries being in debt and how the US should cancel that debt, it kind of makes no sense. But then you understand the IMF and you say, we should abolish Ukrainian debt to the IMF. We should abolish the IMF. We should just get rid of all this debt. This is worthless. Who does this help? But you may have also laughed before understanding the IMF and its purpose. But now, you know better you know better. Just because one country is giving another aid to stop an invasion of an attacking fascist dictatorship doesn't mean that the country giving the aid isn't also doing imperialism. Less awful imperialism, perhaps, but still bad. It's less direct murder and more social murder, and maybe not now, but definitely in the long run. What the Jacobin article and this video should illustrate is that solutions are never as black and white as people say, nor are they always gray. They can sometimes be a different color entirely. Protests in against Wall Street continue to grow across the, the country today. Here in New York, thousands of demonstrators on descended on the financial district as big labor and unions and joined in. Point. Let's talk about a country that was able to get out from under the thumb of the IMF and Western economists. Hooters is so fucking lame, all big titties look the same, and they never fucking offer to give the whole table brain. Bolivia is a country in South America that, for about the past decade, has had a miraculous economic and social development by telling the IMF and economists to go get Ben. Its average economic growth has been 3.2% per year, compared to 1.3% as the average for the rest of Latin America. Through massive nationalization of key industries, state assets have quintupled, private savings have gone up, social spending has exploded, the minimum wage has increased by 600% with no inflation, poverty rates fell from 37.7% to 15.2%,
unemployment was cut from 7.7% to 4.4%, real incomes have risen, and in 2019, for the first time in decades, it owed no money to the International Monetary Fund. All of this happened under the country's first indigenous president, Evo Morales, and his explicitly socialist government led by the party, the Movement for Socialism. Since coming to power, Morales and his government have been subject to blatant lies and intense opposition from the United States, economically, diplomatically, and in the propaganda war, with the U.S. eventually cutting all diplomatic ties in 2008. The 2019 elections, which Morales and the Movement for Socialism won, were overturned. Morales was ousted from power at the pressure of the military and police, and the second vice president of the Senate, Janine Añez, through unconstitutional and illegal votes held in the Senate, assumed control of the country, and began warming up relations with the United States. What was obviously a coup was followed by at least two massacres of protesters and, no surprise, her government immediately and illegally took out a massive loan from the IMF. Luckily for the people of Bolivia, the coup was reverted. Jeanine Añez is currently in prison, Morales and the Movement for Socialism returned to their democratically mandated place in power, and returned all the money to the IMF. But how does the IMF get away with all of this? How is it that people like the woman David Graeber was talking about, who actually spend their days helping poor people, could in any way see the other side and support the International Monetary Fund? How exactly is it that we can hear about events like this and not immediately see it for what it is? Well, it all comes down to debt. One nice thing about the IMF is it's a great counterpoint to those people who say, I only consider facts. I don't have any emotions or value judgments in my arguments or stances. I just support what works. They can pull out all these facts and figures and facty figures about GDP growth and whatnot, and you get to respond with the horrifying, disgusting, ugly reality that exists for the people of whatever country is currently suffering under the grip of the International Monetary Fund. Oh, you've got a study from Neoleb Economics Journals, or sometimes even the IMF itself, about how economic growth may have gone up during IMF-imposed policies. It usually doesn't, by the way. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, let's assume I actually trust neoclassical economists. You need to model something. Linear regression. Right away. No decision trees, no neural nets, no nothing. Linear regression. Independent variable correlated with error. Add an instrumental variable than linear regression right away. Estimating probability, find a sigma. Linear regression. Natural experiment, linear regression. Heteroscedasticity, you sandwich estimator, then believe it or not, more linear regression. But how about the fact that at the same time, all the social spending programs which gave people a higher quality of life were cut, life expectancy and healthcare outcomes went down, child mortality went up, and basically every measure of well-being just collapsed. Like, on par with a nationwide natural disaster. Drunk driving might kill a lot of people, but it also helps a lot of people get to work on time. So, uh, it's impossible to say if it's bad or not. We mentioned Ukraine, but the IMF forced Ecuador to cut fuel subsidies which the poor heavily rely on. Barbados, El Salvador, Lesotho, and Tunisia are being forced to freeze or cut public sector wage jobs, many of which are healthcare jobs like doctors and nurses because these countries have national healthcare. Angola, Nigeria, and Malawi are being forced to increase sales taxes on food, clothing, and household supplies. Sales taxes, of course, being regressive taxes, which means that the poor pay a larger portion of them than the rich do. In fact, just the new loans that the IMF has launched since the start of the pandemic will be forcing many of the poorest countries on earth to increase taxes on food and fuel and cut spending on public services to their poorest residents. And by the way, the IMF knows these requirements spell havoc for the most vulnerable in society. They're not stupid. They're just evil because they're capitalists and this is capitalism. We could go on. There are endless facts. In truth, there's no such thing as unbiased. No one considers just the facts, or all the facts. You can't. There are an infinite number of facts. If someone robs a convenience store, the color of the robber's skin, the star sign they were born under, and the distance from the earth to the sun at the time of the robbery are all facts, but it's your ideology that tells you which of them are important. Anyone who says that they're not biased is lying to themselves. At least people who state their bias are being honest with both you and themselves. The IMF deals in debt. 
So in any conversation about it, the ideology and bias and belief is going to be just below the surface. Get any ideologically neutral rational utilitarian into a discussion on debt, and they'll be talking about people deserving this and not deserving that within minutes. Debt is a funny concept. It's nothing more than a hierarchy between people. It's also incredibly difficult to talk about because it's at the intersection of things our society typically considers incredibly separate. Math, finance, and morality. But actually, it's not that our concept of debt was created from a merger of these three things, but instead it's these three things which all emerged from debt. Up until recently, all our words for debt in the financial sense were the same words for guilt in the moral sense. Christ is the Redeemer, the same word used to buy something back or to get something by paying off a debt. The Lord's Prayer, or if you grew up Catholic, the Our Father, originally went not forgive us our sins, but forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lest you think this just applies to Christianity, the etymology of the words for debt in Indo-European languages as a whole are synonymous with the words for fault and sin and guilt. And though often not as direct a relationship, many Asian languages share this feature as well. The English word pay is from the French paye, which is derived from the Latin pacare, to pacify or make peace with. We still have the same sense of to pay off in modern English. You don't immediately get paid by your boss for the work that you do, it's usually every two weeks or every month or so. If you've done a lot of stuff for your boss, it's quite reasonable to ask when to be expected to be paid, to be made whole. Inches measure length, gallons measure volume, but what do dollars and cents measure? Morality. Long and short are relative measures of length, you bring inches in to be precise. Good and bad, guilty or not guilty, are relative measures of morality, and you bring in dollars and cents to be precise. The difference between owing someone a favor and owing someone a debt is that the amount of a debt can be precisely calculated. Don't believe me? Well, to be sure, we have had a bit of a linguistic disconnect between the two concepts of money and morality, and it's not like I'm saying that those with more money are inherently more good than those with less. In fact, I usually say the exact opposite of this, because fuck rich people. Anyone who's rich in society is only rich because of the hard work of others that they've stolen. But there are many places in our society, and indeed popular consciousness, where we, or at least the heads of our industry and government, reconnect the concept of debt and guilt. After World War I, the German people, supposedly being represented by the German state, were punished for the German state's warmongering. They, rather famously, were made to pay reparations for the previous German state's actions. This again happened to the German people for Nazi Germany's actions. Not just the high command who orchestrated the whole thing, not just the other officials who helped and assisted like the soldiers and the wardens and the police and the publicists and reporters who printed the advertisements for the effort- sorry, printed the propaganda for the effort, and not just all the members of the Nazi party. Everyone in Germany. The concept of Germany, and all the people who composed it, were said to owe those who their leaders invaded. As another example of a time when moral debt was equated with monetary debt, the Iraqi people, who are now under new management, oh, I wouldn't say free, more like under new management, are still paying Kuwait for the invasion launched by Saddam Hussein in 1990. Those were two large-scale examples of entire groups of people being considered bad, or immoral, or at the very least guilty, and having the extent of their immorality, their guilt, their sin, be quantified. In money. But let's get smaller. If you commit a crime, a judge can declare you guilty, and you will owe compensation. Guilt is being quantified in dollars and cents. In civil cases, you will owe the other party an amount of money. Not just for the value of what you physically damaged, oftentimes, but also money on top of that for the immorality of your action. The emotional distress, or even whatever the judge considers fair compensation for this horrible act that you've committed. In criminal cases, you can sometimes be forced to pay a fine. A monetary valuation of your immoral act made by the state. In fact, the word fine originally didn't refer to money at all. It was more common in phrases such as to make fine, i.e. make one's peace, to settle a matter. In fact, it comes from the same root as finish, 
to put an end to something. One whose entire job was to settle matters such as these, you would describe their trade as finance. For smaller things, it may just be monetary, speeding $50, littering $300, or you may have to spend time in prison paying your debt to society, your guilt to society. This is the whole logic behind hard-on-crime laws. Hard-on-crime laws aim to over-punish people, to punish them so much, to make them pay so much more back than the value of the sin that they committed, that they would necessarily come out the other side as better people. After all, they did just pay back more to society than they owed by doing their bad thing. We don't have institutions which take people that commit crimes or act out and then rehabilitate them so that they are less likely to commit further crimes. Instead, we have a system which is meant to correct the guilt and immorality that society suffered to make society whole again. We even call it the justice system. It could equally be called the just compensation system. A term for this type of justice is retributive justice from retribution, literally the repayment from the same root as tribute and contribute. No wonder that any time a group proposes rehabilitation or counseling or any of the other dozens of services which can be provided to actually reduce crime, tons of pro-punishment people have a knee-jerk reaction. Why should society pay for services for someone who owes debt to society? This moral legal pricing stuff is nothing new, by the way. Speaking of hard-on-crime stuff, a common one is the death penalty, paying the ultimate price. Many people preach an eye for an eye, and this eye for an eye stuff is commonly considered to go back to the Code of Hammurabi. But the Code of Hammurabi is not what many people think it is. If you actually go and read it, and you can, it's online, it's just really boring, you'll find it's basically a list of various crimes or sins or faults or debts which are co-equal in terms of guilt, and it then establishes the proper form of payment that is owed for each of these things. Much of the text is prices rather than instructions for eye gouging. As another fun example, there are ancient Irish law codes which denominate the exact value of just about everything. Cows, sheep, cheating on your wife. There is actually some evidence that these ancient advocates from the Emerald Isle who were writing these giant tomes were aware of how hilariously tedious this whole thing was. There is an entry explaining that someone has the right to seek damages if they were stung by someone else's bee, but only if the owner of that bee is first compensated for the value of one dead bee. But then again, that does sound like the sort of thing lawyers would actually be doing seriously. Okay, last one. And this one will hopefully seal the deal on the fact that debt and sin and fault and morality and dollars and cents are all very intricately related. They're in fact the same thing. Say you're the Catholic Church and you need some funds to build a big new cathedral. You already get a tenth of everyone's money from the tithe, but that's not enough. As we all know, nobody cries poor like the rich. So where are all these velvet-robed, gold-encrusted priestly types gonna get the extra dough to build this thing? Well, people are already aware of assigning numerical values to moral acts, that is, prices to sin, so why not do that on behalf of God? Donate to his church and you will be saved from time in purgatory and have your sinful debt to the Almighty forgiven. Well, not really forgiven, more like paid up? It's not like your mortgage is forgiven after you make your last payment. Hey, why not stock up? If you know you want to indulge in the carnal pleasures of this world, then indulge away. Stock up on indulgences. What's one month's wages compared to ten millenniums of purgatory? Tempted by fruit, and they knew they were Petro, sinful and naked without Jesus. Hell. Hello, sinner. God, can you go bomb an abortion clinic or something? You just wait. When that wonderful president finishes stacking the Supreme Court, we won't have to. All throughout history, no concept besides debt has been as effective at justifying absolutely horrible abuses. Beyond the idea that a criminal has taken action and now must pay the price, loan sharking and high-interest credit cards and car loans and mortgages and student loans are all justified on the basis that someone was made up to have been owed something by someone else. Because debt and morality are the same thing, actually, debt is used to justify abuse because once you're considered in debt to someone, you are also considered morally guilty to them as well. One has to pay one's debts. You agreed to. It's very rare that you find someone who is teaching compassion in non-financial areas and non-compassion in non-financial areas. One has to pay one's debts. They have to pay the price. They agreed to it. They did it. Hopefully this has gotten you mad. 
The richest people on Earth are certainly not the most moral, and the poorest are certainly not the most sinful. And yes, I agree. But you see how all the language around wealth, especially in the West, now starts to make sense? One of the reasons this has hopefully made you mad is that oftentimes, those who are actually in debt are not in debt for anything immoral that they've done. Most debt exists not because we are naturally sinful creatures, but specifically so that violence of some sort, either direct, indirect, physical, or social, can be justified by the person owed money against the person owing money. People can be kicked out of their homes, have their means of transportation taken away, be denied medical care, be denied an education, or forced to have the lion's share of their wages turned over to the most well-off and monetarily secure people in the world. And still, some insufferable asshole will come up and defend the financers because you have to pay your debts. Take 2008. Millions of American families were kicked out of their homes. The country and its workers had spent countless labor hours turning raw materials into spaces for people to live comfortably. Though many American homes are ugly, I will grant that, I assure you that they are quite a bit more beautiful than the backseat of a car or the underside of a bridge. But suddenly, millions of American families were prevented from using these creations simply because they owed money to the bank. These homes weren't destroyed, there was no natural disaster, in fact, nothing real or material actually happened. It was just a bunch of property relations which all exist on paper, or I guess nowadays exist just in electrons on hard drives in computers. Nothing real actually happened, yet everyone was kicked out of their homes. Now, you and me, we understand that this is unjust. These people lived in these homes, and the banks got to decide whether they could use them or not. It's not like the bank built them, though. Or, in fact, did any of the stuff in getting the house built. The bank was acting more like a permitting office. But instead of just issuing a permit to make sure that the house was built correctly and that there was responsibility, they just issued permits and then charged you for them, like a corrupt government official. The money isn't actually needed in any way. It's just permits to give you control over other people's labor to get a house built. But, nevertheless, the cull continued. Millions of homes remained vacant, and millions of people were pushed out of them. And when Uncle Sam turned on the money printer, when he realized he could just make up as many of these, you know, permits as he wanted to, it was the lenders who orchestrated the collapse and owned all the homes that got a bailout. A massive pump of purchasing power. Is that tax money that the Fed is spending? It's not tax money. The banks have um, accounts with the Fed much the same way that you have an account in a commercial bank. So to lend to a bank, we simply use the computer to mark up the uh, size of the account that they have with the Fed. So it's much more akin, uh, although not exactly the same, but it's much more akin to printing money than it is to borrowing. You've been printing money. Well, effectively. Debt is created from nothing to justify abuse. It's even mirrored in the language an abuser would use. Think about all that I've done for you. I gave you the money to build this house. Today, most of the world is heavily in debt. Most of these loans have their principal, that is the original amount borrowed, paid back sometimes two or three times over. Most of the people in the West are also heavily in debt for what are just the basic necessities of life and what were previously provided without needing to go into debt. The same material wealth has existed basically since the 1970s in the United States. The only thing that has changed is that now everyone is in heavy, heavy debt relations. Most of the countries which are in such monstrous debt levels are in fact in debt to the very country that invaded them. Invading armies 4,000 years ago, and the ones of the modern period, will frame their invasions as if they themselves were the victim, and that the conquered people owed reparations. Just as your boss is likely to say that you owe him for your job, or at least the opportunity. When the bank kicks you out of your house or denies you your medical care, you actually owe them because you made them a promise and now you're reneging on it. If nothing else, these ancient invaders said, the conquered at least owed them for their lives for having not been killed. Debt is a tool of the powerful. It places moral obligation, it places sin, on whoever the powerful so desires. If a bank kicks a family out of their home, seemingly endless groups of insufferable psychopaths will come out of the maggot heap and cry exasperatedly, Well, they owe the bank! Debt tells these people, and is supposed to tell everyone, who to feel sympathy towards. In this case, not the homeless, but the ones who took their house away from them. 
Drunk driving might kill a lot of people, but it also helps a lot of people get to work on time. So uh, it's impossible to say if it's bad or not. Michael Hudson actually made the argument that, you know, 30 years ago, rich people discovered that poor people actually feel they should pay their debts, which had never occurred to them because they don't, right? So, so that one really works. People feel that, you know, you really have to pay your debts. It doesn't matter if you've been maneuvered into it, which is a really, really convenient thing for the guys who are running a financialized system, right? It also is supposed to tell us who violence is justified against. In this case, the reverse. Not the people who are kicking people out onto the street, but the ones who are being kicked to the street. Okay, okay, enough philosophizing. I get it. The IMF and the banks that it issues loans on behalf of take advantage of this quirk on the human psyche to justify themselves in a position of power over the poor, toiling masses of far-flung regions of the world. Capitalism is an international system of robbery. What else is new? Well, you're right. This isn't new. The IMF and Wall Street are not the first to come up with this little scheme. To understand the International Monetary Fund, you need to know the history of colonialism. This little debt and market-induced manipulation to permanently tie the people of one country to another while sucking out all the wealth in the process is in fact the main squeeze of the West's main squeeze, colonialism. But that will have to wait until next time. This video is long enough as it is. So, in summary, debt is evil, money is the source of all evil, it's easier for a camel to fit through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God, and even though taxation is theft, Profit is even bigger theft, and debt is perhaps the greatest scam in human history, so shut the fuck up, you libertarian asshole.